So meanwhile, Rosemary is sitting at Caraway's office, getting all her mistakes fixed for her, and receiving tutoring on the one actual new concept she'll learn across her entire time studying at the academy. Parsley is busy banging away at the forge. Thanks for letting me use this station for my Everything Hours project. Oh, of course. I'm glad you're um, I'm making a... What is that? No, oh, it's not anything yet. Just bothering some metal to get my hammer used to this forge. To reiterate, Parsley is currently busy literally wasting her time with nothing. And yet, the possibility of doing something constructive, helping Rosemary with her worries, never crosses her mind. Anyway, to spice up her everything hours, the teacher comes to Parsley with a special mission. I have an important job for you. What you need? You'll need the right tool for this. Hmm. One of the portraits in the far hallway is all screwy. Needs to be rehung. You'll know which one it is because of how it's all screwy. Here's the right tool. Oh, okay, sure. See you. How specific and also random. Where's this far hallway? Which hallway is that? How is Parsley supposed to find it? Or is there a part of the school that is literally called the far hallway? What the fuck? Oh, and never mind the question of why you yourself haven't fixed it already, since you clearly have witnessed the problem firsthand. In any case, Parsley heads out to complete this most important task. The portrait in question ends up being of the triad, the headmistresses of the school. Curiously, the characters in the portrait shift position as the frame tilts. Because Harry Potter, I guess? And as a side note, because I can't imagine where else to mention this, the very existence of the triad is an unnecessarily muddled concept. Clearly, there's something funky going on with them. They look similar enough to be related, but it's never clearly stated. Are they three generations of guardians who just happen to share the role of principal? Why would the responsibilities be split between three people in the first place? Or is this some kind of especially powerful mage who has somehow severed themselves across three distinct temporal states? I'm just tossing ideas here. The most tangible information we get about the trio is a single throwaway line in episode 11. It's a blink and you miss it moment, but here it is. Ugh, being immortal with you two is exhausting. So on top of every other high concept with little to no explanation in the show, here we have these apparently immortal beings watching over the academy. Are they some other race entirely? Or is it a spell of some kind? Is it new or old? What kind of immortality are we talking about? Are they literally eternal? Are they indestructible? Or do they live only as long as they manage to avoid the pointy end of a halberd? This is not a small thing. Immortal beings walking amongst normal folk carries extremely heavy implications. Think of the wealth of knowledge and experience one could accumulate. How much prosperity or chaos one could spread with this kind of power? None of these implications are brought up. Whimsy for the sake of whimsy is the best faith interpretation there is. The triad are just there. Sometimes. Whenever it would be inconvenient for the plot for them to exist, such as when a devious villain infiltrates the school, they are nowhere to be found. Much like the portrait itself, they are needlessly complicated, useless decoration. They are barely characters. I mean, for fuck's sake, we never even learned the trio's actual names. It is never a good idea to just toss these kinds of high concept elements into a story for the sake of making everything feel more magical. Things like this are prime fodder for theory crafting, sure, but that is not the point of storytelling, having the audience write the story for you. It is the author's duty to tell their story, to explain how their worlds and characters and fantastical concepts work, to have it make sense. Simply dumping everything and anything from the storytelling spice cabinet into the narrative gravy will only result in unpalatable sludge. More often than not, 
Simplicity is the most effective starting point for any author. Just focus on the immediate story you truly wish to communicate. You see, there is no way for the audience to know beforehand which details are important and which are just random clutter. Stuffing all these concepts into your story without narrative utility, just because they sound cool and mysterious in your head, will only result in the audience pondering about things that have no bearing on the actual story. If the audience has an endless list of unanswered questions, it makes it unnecessarily hard for them to focus on the characters and the moment-to-moment -moment narrative. If the world and its possibilities are poorly defined, then it is impossible to have stakes, because the immediate question in any conflict will be, why doesn't this character simply do this obvious thing? Or, why don't the heroes just use such and such to fix everything? If the Triad are immortal guardians, then why aren't they constantly on the field, saving innocent lives, fighting the good fight, protecting the land from any and all threats? The only logical reason is that they are either idiots, lazy or selfish. And I'm sure that is not the author's intent, yet here we are. But of course, this line of reasoning only applies if your audience has their IQ above room temperature. If you believe your audience to be drooling dumb fucks, then you can obviously ignore everything I just said and just keep slamming your face against the keyboard. Now steering back from the side tangent, Parsley fixes up the stilted portrait by clinking the frame with a hammer instead of the classic method of just straightening it. But hey, she was given a hammer, gotta use it for something. But in a surprising twist of fate, a trapdoor suddenly opens up and swallows Parsley in a bottomless pit, never to be seen again. <laughs> No, no, never mind, she's just fine. And before you put too much effort into trying to make sense of the whole random Looney Tunes trapdoor shenanigans, just hold off for a minute, because this whole series of events quickly becomes more... just more. So on this random hallway, there is a trapdoor that leads into a pit, that leads into a set of catacombs, that leads into a tunnel, that leads into a cave full of fluorescent parasects, that leads to a door that needs to be opened by inserting a pole into a hole next to the door, that eventually leads into a storage room, that leads into a crawl space, that has a set of nails, which after getting hammered, open up a door that leads back into the forge. What the hell was that? And in case you are wondering, no, that is it. I swear I didn't leave anything out. But the same cannot be said about the show. All this to hang a picture. <laughs> we escaped the dungeon, we found our way out of that bizarro broom closet, we solved a dozen riddles for the grog mob, saved a hornet's marriage, climbed walls, climbed between walls? What are you talking about? That never happened. So let me lay this out. Instead of even attempting to answer any of these obvious questions, the show decides to waste close to 5 whole minutes, that's 25% of the episode, on this utterly useless misadventure. And not only that, the show also decides to leave out the part of this travesty that actually sounds like something of substance. This is the worst kind of fluff B-plot I have yet to see in any show. The word filler does not begin to describe this. The actual content happens off-screen, and the only thing we get to see is the character moving from place to place. This is blatant waste of the audience's time, and an insult towards everyone's intelligence. I cannot fathom how something like this makes it into any finished product. At no point of production, not while writing, storyboarding, animating, voice acting, no one in the team questioned any of this. No one pointed out how none of this makes sense, or that half the plot is missing. 
This kind of aimless pumpling is the first thing to get axed from any script. Provided the author cares to do even a single redraft. But in the name of fairness, there must be something the writers are going for. In their mind, surely there must be some utility to this subplot. What is the takeaway here? That was a test. Good job, you passed. Wait, what was the test? I've been lost for hours. You could say that. Or you could say you've been excelling at the use of one tool for hours. A dinky little mallet? So apparently, Parsley needed to learn this important lesson. The lesson that you can in fact use a tool in more ways than one. The fact that you can shove a stick into a hole, you can use a hook to climb, and you can, indeed, hammer down nails with a literal hammer. This is a show made by adults, for adults. And that is highly presumptuous from the teacher, isn't it? Just assuming that Parsley wouldn't be already enlightened about all the wonderful uses for a dinky little mallet. When was it implied that she wouldn't be proficient with any kind of tool? What's the logic here? Or was it because she nearly orgasmed by the sight of those beefy hammers? Was the whole reason for this exercise so that Parsley grew to appreciate tiny wimpier tools? Instead of lusting after meaty mazes? Take that as you wish. Whoa, Parsley, have you been rolling in mulch? Funny story, actually. I'll tell you what's funny. The writers had vastly more organic way of implying Caraway's past and identity in the same episode, no less. And still they decided to approach the matter with all the finesse of a mallet to the face. And as always, a huge thanks to each of you for listening till the end. For liking, subbing, commenting, it's all appreciated. And a special thank you goes to my supporters on Patreon. And an extra special thanks to my 10 euro patron Wyland. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.